Happy Sabbath. Thanks, John. There we go. Three, two, one, go. <laughs> you guys are so kind. I love that about you all. Yes, indeed. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this wonderful Sabbath day that may your words come out of my mouth, be in my mind, be in my heart, be in my actions. We thank you so much for Jesus who makes it all possible. Amen. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all of your ways, everything you do, and he will direct your paths. When I die, if I die before you, put that on my gravestone. Live by that. It's a, trust has been a big thing in my life, and, and I decided when God was talking to me this week that this is what we would talk about. We're going to be in Numbers 20. If you would like to follow along with me, it will not be up on the screen. Numbers 20. Now, in the first month, the whole Israelite community arrived at the desert of Zin. At the end of the, the desert wandering, they're going about to go into the, the promised land, the time that's finally come. And they stayed at Kadesh, and something sad happens. There, Miriam died and was buried. Moses' sister dies just before she gets to go over. Now, there was no water for the community, and the people gathered in opposition to Moses and Aaron again, and they quarreled with Moses. And they said, if only we had died when our brothers fell dead before the Lord, and why did you bring the Lord's community into the wilderness, and we and our livestock should die here why did you bring us up to out of Egypt for this terrible, terrible place? It has no grain of figs, grapevines, pomegranates, and there is no water to drink. Did that sound like a good wine? You guys are a bunch of whiners. So think about poor Moses. He's made this journey. It's not 40 years, it's 80 years, because he went out by himself, goes, meets God, then comes back, and then releases the people. And now he's in 40 years of these people, and he has to basically let everybody die except him, Caleb, and Miriam, and Aaron to go into the promised land with all the kids, right? So M Moses did what Moses did. Moses and Aaron went to the assembly, to the entrance, to the tent meeting, and fell face down, and the glory of God appeared to them. Moses was good at that. If you read the book of Exodus, actually Moses has 33 face-to-face -face meetings with God, 33 face-to-face -face discussions with his friend. And at that 33 time is when Moses' face begins to glow so brightly he needs a veil to come down on his face because Joshua and the rest of them can't handle the Shekinah's reflection in Moses. But Moses knew what to do with his friend. He goes face down and the glory of the Lord, the Shekinah, envelops them. And the Lord says to Moses, my friend, take the staff and you and your brother Aaron gather the assembly together one more time and this time, speak to that rock. Use your voice. Speak to them before their eyes. And it's going to pour out its water. You will bring water out of the rock for the community so they and their livestock can drink. So Moses took the staff, as God had told him to, from the Lord's presence just as he had commanded him. And verse 10 says, he and Aaron gathered the assembly together again in front of the rock. And Moses then turns to them all and says, listen, you rebels, you bunch of rebels. Must we bring you water out of this rock? Question mark. And then he raises his arm and he strikes the rock twice with his staff and water gushes out in the community and his livestock, they all drink. But, careful when you see a but in the, in the Bible. The Lord says to Moses and Aaron, because you didn't trust me. You didn't trust in me enough to honor me as holy, ready, here we go, 
This is for Melanie and I and, and uh, Manny. In the sight of the Israelites, because you didn't honor me in front of the Israelites, you will not bring this community into the land I had given them. Huge responsibility of what people are watching. My challenge to each of you in the audience and home today is to ask yourselves, do I trust God enough to obey him? Even when your sister dies, even when the people are around you, even when your frontal cortex is so clogged that you can't see straight, can you still see God and trust him enough to speak it rather than do what you want and strike it? Tell him, don't get too mad at, mad at Moses because when you're compromised, think about in the life when you've been compromised. That's not a good time to be making decisions when you're angry, when you're lonely, when you're tired, when you're hungry, when the person in front of you has cut you off again. It's not a good time to be making decisions. Can God be trusted? Trust is the problem of the entire universe. You have trust, you, and we need trust. If you don't think so, think about when you pull out your car from the Camelback parking lot and you're going to go left. Everybody with me? You need trust. Here's, here's the trust you need. The guy coming from here in those two lanes that have just made that light, they're on their accelerator. You better get in that middle lane before they get there. And you better trust that they don't absolutely T-bone you, okay? If you've ever felt that before. And when you're in that lane, then you want to go over into the right lane, make sure that that guy who just made that light doesn't come over and hit you from behind. You need trust. You trust that they passed their driver's test. You need trust that you did. We need God to trust. We need to trust. When you got here, you hoped that nobody was sitting in your pew. I mean, if you got there and you kind of look at the person like, what are you doing here? I got, it's my name right there. <laughs> we sit in the same place every time, right? Trust. You trusted that. You trusted that your clothes were going to be clean. You trusted that the electricity stayed on last night, kept your refrigerator clean. So you went to go get food this morning. It wasn't bad. It was good. You think, oh, Mark, those, wait a minute. Trust is important. And we take it for granted on a lot, a lot of instances. Tom and I were up in Prescott, and we, my favorite diner up there is called the Waffle Iron. It's got old-fashioned waitresses that hassle you. I love them. I love banter with them. And we go in there, and, but I see something funny at the cash register. I see this. In God we trust sign, and right underneath it has a picture of this, and then it says, it says everybody else, cash only. God, everybody else, cash only. Yeah, we trust in that too. When Pam and I were in the Sistine Chapel and I got to see this beautiful painting, which actually is about 50 million feet in the air, and you look up here and you got all these people around, I'm like, where is that? It's not that big, but you can, you can see it. It is beautiful. You wondered how he held his neck like that, the paint. It must have been a long time. But what this reminds us of is that the lack of trust began in heaven. It came to earth in the garden. It was passed on to Adam and Eve, and distrust was inherited by generations up until this very moment and this very day in this church. It's in your DNA. Trust is everything, absolutely everything. Nothing else in life compares to it, nothing. When we know that what we're doing is what God has called us to do, you know you felt that sometimes in your lives, we get a sense of security. When you know that decision is right, the place where you've arrived at just feels good, that person across from you is just, wow. You know, this peace comes and surrounds us. It's obvious to us, and it's obvious to the person we're talking about and the people that are watching us. Things that used to baffle us suddenly become clear. We can make decisions better. We seem to be able to intuitively make decisions a lot easier. Why? Because our hearts and our minds have completely become focused. No longer on what we want to do, but now we're focused on what God wants to do, seeking what 
he wants to do, desiring his love, asking for his will and the power to carry that out. Okay, not that one. David, you're killing me. This happened to you, didn't I? I was waiting for the snow to come up. <laughs> Bet you're wishing for snow, right? Now. You think back in your life when our lives are in flux. Somebody's died. You lost a job. You graduated from school and you don't know what you're going to do. You want that girlfriend. You want that boyfriend. Whatever you're going through, when we're trying to find an answer to our problems and we want that lasting answer to what we're looking for, we pray. We pray for what we want. Don't we? I have. We push to gain an answer to our prayers for the outcome to go our way. I'm happy because I'm at Burger King. I want it my way, right? Come on. Are we expecting God to be like a vending machine? You just put the quarter in and pull it, and there comes your potato chips. There you go. Or a genie to grant your every wish. You only get three. Mm -mm. What we sometimes end up, most times, our prayers don't get answered the way we want, when we want, and then... We pull back from God saying, you're not answering my prayer. You're not giving me that job. I need, rent's due in two weeks. I need the job now. Definitely trust is lost. This kind of prayer seems to be accompanied by a feeling of loss, of loneliness, uneasiness within us. They're just disjointed. The question is, do we trust the Lord with our problems and potential outcomes, even when they're not getting our way? Do you? Yes. It's hard when it doesn't go your way. I had to do two anointings this week. The privilege, I should say, of doing two anointings. One of them, after we had done the anointing, um, we went downstairs, got in a car, and as soon as I got home, I got a call that he passed away. Yeah. If you knew that your end is now, I mean, you're gonna, you're gonna act differently? Your prayer's gonna be differently? The man was 94 years old and he couldn't speak. He was in a coma, but that was his. And the other one we did, we prayed, anointed. Yeah, Melanie and I went on that one. And by the time we both got home, she got an IV and, I mean, she couldn't talk. She could not talk. And she was so relieved that the pastors had come to anoint her and she felt better and she rose and she got up and she went home. I mean, this is this side of the scale. It's here, here. It's just amazing. In the outcomes, both of us, Melanie, want it, and I want them to rise and get better, but sometimes that doesn't happen like that. It's not my call. My call is only to put my, my trust in Jesus. I never expected my younger brother to die before him. Did you see that picture of him riding that speedboat? Oh, he was like that. Not like me. Too safe. Way too safe. Way too safe. I think the question is, am I in God's will? I think I've, I've learned at, the, at my age and how, many how long I've been doing this, I just go, you know, you give up the fight. You quit fighting everybody, everything. And when, when, when I gave up the fight and I said, okay, because I told you so many times, I've got to tell you again, he he's, wakes me up at four in the morning and I'd like to sleep. And I used to fight him and I don't fight him anymore. I go, what? It's four in the morning, what? And then he'll say, I go, can I go to bed yet? I'll do it. I'll promise I'll do it in the morning. And boy, you better do it because that's how we have a conversation. As long as I'm doing it his way and I know and I trust him that he loves me and he cares for me and he has everything good in intention for me, I can better go, okay, I'll stick my hand in the box. Do you like that? Good job, Pam. That was a good story. <laughs> Riley, I do trust you too. Do you trust God enough to give him your life? and everything that you want. Unless we know for sure that we're walking in unity and harmony with his will, we're bound to be in despair and constant ask questions like, Lord, am I doing the right thing? Did I make that right decision? Is this the right person in my life? 
Is this really the vocation and job you've chosen for me today? Are you okay with what I'm doing? I think when you're in line with God, you don't have to ask that. Are you okay with me doing that? No, you'll know. What we find is that this kind of unity and goodwill we're searching for can only exist when there's complete trust. Complete trust and trustworthiness, mutual love and respect. But the Bible pictures the whole human race is caught up in a great web of distrust. Today, we're surrounded by a cancel culture. Cancel culture is an attitude of unwillingness to listen to our brothers and sisters that have a different opinion than us. Lies versus truth abound everywhere, from our schools to our jobs to our government to our earth. The earth's population is polarized in every, every front from religion to politics to race, everything. The love of most is truly growing cold. It's part of the universe-wide crisis of trust that centers around the question, is God worth trusting? Our infinite God has been accused of untrustworthiness from the get-go. There was a war in heaven. Wars are usually because people don't agree. Revelation 12, 7 says, that was between the angels and the devil himself, and Michael and the angels fought against him, and his place was found not in heaven anymore, and he was cast to the earth with his angels with him. This particular war was not fought with swords and lightsabers but it was fought with the mind. It was fought with words. It was fought over the character of God himself. Mainly the devil claimed that God could not be trusted. In the book, The Desire of Ages, the book that converted me, on page 761 in that chapter, it is finished, the author states this. Satan declared. Who did? God declare it? No, no, that was, Satan declared it. The law of God could not be obeyed. Satan declared that, not God. Justice was inconsistent with mercy. That is an accusation and a belief of? Then why do we believe that? Why? We must change our way of belief because if that's what the dirt bag says, don't believe it, he's still a liar. If I can't change that thing in my mind, I will not trust you, I will not trust my wife, I will not trust anyway, and I will certainly not trust my life to him. He, Satan says you can't do it. It's because he had a trouble doing it. Justice was inconsistent with mercy. Really? That one. Satan declared, those are these are words, this is a quote, that should the law be broken, it would be impossible for the Sin. to forgiven. I have sat with so many people in this church, in the Camelback Church, in Green Valley, in Mountain View, and the places I've pastored have said, I can't remember that sin I did way back, therefore God keeps a record of that and I'm going to hell. Wait a minute. Satan said that. The law can't be broken. It's impossible for the sinner to be pardoned. Jesus said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt. The Psalms say, as far as the east is from the east, my sins will be removed from me. Put it on your lips. Put it on your heart. Trust God that that's what he's going to do. He's what he's promised. The character of God is being smudged by the churches. Yes. There's churches that still believe this. That Satan did, but God says that. He didn't say that. Every sin must meet its... Take that off your lips. God does not punish, okay? He's not like, he didn't get in the Garden of Eden and say, hey, Adam, where are you? And he pulls his belt off and he's carrying his belt looking for Adam. He didn't do that. This is how he said it. Adam, Adam, where are you? And Adam comes out, you know, oh, oh, dude. He says, what's wrong? Uh, why are you hiding from me? Oh, oh. 
God did not condemn him. Forgiveness came in the garden. The cross confirmed it, but way before the cross was the Garden of Eden where we were forgiven, and we were given a Messiah to come through the line. And every single time the devil tries to come in and, and wipe it out, wipe out the Messiah, God is left to one move, one move. You think of Noah. It says all men became bad except one. So now God has to do something because he keeps his word. And he said, well, the Messiah is going to come through that line, so I must step in. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to take all the rest of the ones out, and I will leave you, Noah, so that the line of the Messiah can come through you. Is that punish or is that mercy? mercy? That's mercy. If that didn't happen, we wouldn't be here. Christ wouldn't have come, and we certainly wouldn't be here. God loves us, cares for us. He's crazy about us. He just, he's like a loving parent that wants to love, forgive, heal, save, restore, renew, and reconcile. That's what, what, is that me doing this thing? It keeps cutting out. You guys, this is so important. This is a salvitical problem. This is it. This is what the great controversy is about. A lie believed breaks the circle of love and trust, resulting in fear and ultimately self-centeredness happens from that. Memorize this. A lie believed breaks the circle of love and trust, resulting in fear, ultimately self-centeredness. You don't think so? Let me tell you a story. So, I come home, or you come home, I should say this because I'll get in trouble if I put Pam out here too far in this one. And somebody has taken a picture of me kissing a girl, okay? Big picture like that, eight by 10. But what's happened is my picture has been photoshopped into somebody else, because I didn't do that. But my, it's a really good Photoshop. It really looked like me, okay? And they send it to Pam. So Pam's opening the mail and she opens it and boom, it's like, so I walk in the door, hi, honey, how are you? A lie, believed, breaks the circle of love and trust. She no longer trusts me. And our love has been interfered with because of a lie. Did I do it? Did I have, did I, was I with that girl? Come on. No, it's a lie. I wasn't, but it sure looks like it. It looks like that box when you open it. Pam, stop it. You, <laughs> she's going, Phew. <laughs> when, you, when you're thinking about that box, you know, when Riley pulls his hand out, you think, ooh, there's something sharp in there. I'm not going to put my hand in there. No way. You know, that was a lie. That was a lie. What was in there was cookies. And by the time you all figured that out, they were all gone. <laughs> but the good thing, Christ has enough cookies for y'all. He loves us and cares for us and just wants all of us to be in his home. When I, don't, when I stop trusting, I get fearful. She would go, oh no, my husband's been cheating on me. Oh no, that means we have to get a divorce. Oh no, that means he doesn't get the house. <laughs> I get the cat, right? There's fear in that, and ultimately I go to self-centeredness and selfishness because that's where I'm afraid. That's what we did. That's what we just went through with COVID. You guys know what fear is, right? <gasps> Where's mine? There's not enough toilet paper in the world. <laughs> Recently, where are the eggs? All the chickens in the world have stopped laying eggs. <laughs> Come on, man. We're talking about fear, real stuff, real life. When I get into self-centeredness, when I don't believe that God will heal me, when I believe that he's going to love me and restore me and not punish me, look at how I different I act. When I got to this church, I came from one that, a little different than this one, okay? Where they taught that if you didn't do what I say, what the priest said, you would go to hell. They believed that if you paid enough money, I could get my friends out of purgatory, especially my brother. That was a joke. Anyway. <laughs> purgatory. And then, and then if all the babies, what about the babies? Oh, they, they, they're already there. They're in between. They're hanging out. I'm like, oh. So you had me read this, this crazy book. You challenged me, and I'm challenging you. 
if you haven't read it cover to cover, because when I read it cover to cover, like a, with an underlining pen, suddenly I couldn't find purgatory. It wasn't in there. I couldn't find limbo. I couldn't find Sunday. I couldn't find a lot of things, and then suddenly I started to question. Have I been lied to? Yes, I was. That made me mad. My whole family's from there. It meant fear. I have to leave and come to see you guys because you guys have got this truth. And I'm like, a lie believed. Been given, thank you, an answer to the accusation and provided a remedy. Thank you. We've been given a remedy. We've been, had a sickness, a mind sickness of believing that lie. And so the only way to undo a lie is to see the truth. And that truth is the cross. That truth is that from beginning to end, God's had a plan to love me, to forgive me, to restore me to his original design, if I'm willing to hang out with him long enough and let him do the surgery without any anesthetic. Only by demonstration of trustworthiness over a long period of time and under a variety of circumstances can trustworthiness be convincingly reestablished. And that's the Bible. When I returned home after many years of playing out in the streets, I went to go apologize to my brother, the one that died. And I apologized to him for how I treated him and, and how I had acted toward him when we were growing up. And he turned to me with all the anger of a tiger and said, you're a liar. I don't want anything to do with you. You're an addict you're in a, and you're lying. Get out of my life. And I went, watch what I do and hear what I say. I will leave, but just watch. You know how long it took? Six years. Just before he died, unbeknownst to us both, we got together and he turned to me over dinner and he said, it's true. You really have changed. He goes, I'm, I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you. And he died two weeks later in a car accident and just took his life. But we got that moment. We got that time. He got baptized the next week. Didn't tell me. He wouldn't let me baptize him. He got, he got baptized without me. But he got baptized, right? We'll see him in heaven. It'll be fun. <laughs> the Bible, Bible generally understood as dealing primarily with God's plan of salvation to save sinners. That's true. However, the larger issue hiding throughout the pages of all 66 books is the question of truthfulness and trustworthiness of our Savior, our God, our Creator. The question looms, can God be trusted and thus obeyed and loved? This question has been on our lips on the whole human race and on the entire onlooking universe. It's not just us. God's answer is much for them as it is today. Thank you, John. Listen, folks, trusting God doesn't mean you have to give up all hope. It doesn't mean you have to give up your dreams because God created you to dream. He created you to be just like him. He wants you to go and help other people and work with the animals and work with other people and just love. That's what he's created us for. Have those dreams. Dream them. Trusting God means transferring our confidence and our hope from ourselves and give it to him. The great controversy we're involved in is life altering. It's over the character of God. When Philip asked Jesus, show us the Father, Philip, or show us the Father, Jesus, and he replied, Philip, haven't I been with you all this time? Here I am. Look at me. Haven't you not heard what I've said and what I've done with the miracles and how I've loved you and cared for you? This is my challenge for you today. Hear this one. This is a big one. To alter this idea of the character of God, this needs to change. And this needs to change. And it's not easy. 
I challenge you today to go home. Open your Bibles. Find your favorite Bible. Get a pen and a piece of paper, a big, and carefully review all four Gospels, starting with Matthew, going all the way to John. Write down every good character you find of Jesus Christ and God. Matthew 1, he'll save his people from our sins. Who are his people? All of us. He's Emmanuel. God is with us. He's come home. We've come home. He wants us to be with him. Write down things like that as you go through. and Because we have to be transformed through our minds, the Bible tells us. And as we start to see Christ, and every time you see Christ, put God there. Because they're the same. Emmanuel, God is with us. And this starts to transform us from the inside out. We'll find that God is gracious. He's good. He's inviting us openly and freely to examine the evidence, to study and come and understand the entire record found in the 66 books, and to judge not us being judged. We're judging him. Judge for yourselves if the truth is on God's side. And if we find him worthy of trust and obedience from us. Coming to trust and obey Christ is how we begin to experience God's true desire and love for us. Pray with me. Yes. yes. <laughs> Father in heaven, thank you for babies. Thank you for this book. I don't know what we do without it. I don't know how people are living today without you. I ask that you make everybody in this congregation feel safe and know that you love them and care for them and that you love, forgive, and heal, save, restore, and renew them. And if you just give you a chance, let us have the courage to move forward in this upcoming crisis that's about to hit us. Keep us strong. Give us the Holy Spirit to give us the strength because we cannot do it alone. We need you, Father. Thank you for the opportunity of saving me and allowing me to come serve as an under-shepherd for you today. Thank you for Pastor Melanie and Manny. Thank you for Pastor John, all the pastors that serve. Thank you for everybody behind the scenes that makes this happen. And Father, thank you. In your name we pray. Amen.